The Forerunners, founded by composer and bassist Jimmy Merritt. Their material uses his unique Forerunner system of cross rhythms and cross modal harmony. They've been a part of Philadelphia's jazz community for decades, inspiring audiences while also challenging their own abilities as players. Yet so far, they have never released a recording. Jimmy Merritt, one of the premier bassists who helped define the hard bop era of the 1950s. A jazz player who cut his teeth on rhythm and blues. While a member of Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, he played on some of the most iconic recordings in the history of the idiom. A legend in his hometown of Philadelphia, still actively creating new music today. Jimmy started Forerunner in West Philadelphia during the early 1960s, seeking to expand the boundaries of jazz. He started a workshop on 52nd and Market and was along with him, Warren McLennan, and Coleman Duncan. And some other musicians will let me we used to get together. We used to get together every Sunday. We started inviting people down because it wasn't it wasn't small, it wasn't a large place. But we started inviting some people down also to just just to be there. And but Jimmy, from rehearsing with him, the information that he gave me, uh, I must say, we was all like it was like going to the highest institution in the whole world. First met Jimmy Merritt in 1957. Uh, Odin uh, introduced him to him, went out with his father of the real estate, uh, was head of a studio in the basement for the PS. And we started rehearsing with him, the Odin, Jimmy, and then Dave uh, drums, Jack and Dave Pesh. Was that, would you say, was that like the, the, the very beginnings of the Forerunners? Uh, yeah, well, uh, he started giving me music to go home to, 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 to learn. That's how I met Warren. He, uh, he brought his band down to play at this. And, uh, and that's when he started studying with Jimmy. Meanwhile, you know, Jimmy, after he heard me with John, he said, well, look, man, we ain't going with him, I want you. Then he started showing me uh, uh, not only on theory on personal paper, which I already understood, but how I applied to my instrument, percussion, you know, as a jazz rubber. Forerunner has its own system of chord notation based on intervals of fourths. The use of cross rhythms allows each player to internalize their own sense of time. These concepts would bear fruit in Jimmy's composition, Nomo featured on Max Roach's album, Drums Unlimited, released in 1966. Namo, a blues in 7-4 time, was a distinctive introduction of Jimmy's system to the jazz world. During that time, playing 7-4, it wasn't that easy. But the way Jimmy had Nomo constructed, the harmonic structure as well as, as, well as the rhythmic structure, you know, you could hear, you could hear the form, and it was, it was one of them kind of tunes that would catch you like that. Instead of just using the red nine, uh, uh, raised nine, he had ways of choosing four chords for all colors. First saw your father playing Jimmy Merritt's band, I mean in Max Roach's band, in 1968 in the Left Bank Jazz Society, it blew me away. When, when after I saw that, I mean, it was new other bass, but he was a man. By the late 1960s, Jimmy continued working out of New York City as a first call sideman, touring with the likes of Sonny Rollins and Dizzy Gillespie. Lee Morgan called on his old Jazz Messengers bandmate to go on the road, where they made one of Lee's most famous recordings, Live at the Lighthouse. Two of Jimmy's compositions were featured, and his original music was finally getting some notice. But in between gigs, Jimmy's main focus was to keep Forerunner going in Philly. Musicians came aboard, seeking to expand their knowledge. I mean, this is some different stuff that they're doing. I didn't know what to make of it. Really like going to the university. Sitting up there with, with Jimmy and with the going over those tunes that I've been, and the music was just uh, very, very, very enlightening. 
some of the most advanced stuff I think that I've ever participated in. Cobalt gave me a rhythm and took me 20 years to play. You had to know uh, how to listen to the melody of the other players in relation to what you're playing in order to uh, stay orientated all the time. Jimmy Merritt moved back to Philadelphia in the early 1970s. The tragic death of Lee Morgan and some serious health issues had taken their toll. While he maintained a lower profile, other band members stepped up to keep the Forerunners in motion, and their long rehearsal sessions became legend. Yet their live performances were infrequent, and only a few took place outside of the Philadelphia area throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. My dad had had, had, had gotten this Forerunners project thing going again once he moved back to Philly, and he was like, why don't you come and be part of what we're doing? I had an opportunity to learn, first of all, how to play the instrument and learn how to play music, but learning through the system that Jimmy had created for his music. Despite all that was accomplished before, Despite the influence Jimmy's music had on a generation of Philadelphia's most adventurous jazz players, the Forerunners had never made a recording, until now. The music that I was playing with the Forerunners the only bass player who played that music was Jimmy, so I could only emulate him. I immersed myself in his playing style in order to understand his concepts and how I could apply it to playing the bass. It's opened up freedom of ideas and hearing things, you know, in terms of both rhythmically and harmonically. That's a, uh, it just opened me, opened me up as a, as a person. The Forerunners had finally begun the process of recording. Starting with five compositions from Jimmy's vast, unrecorded repertoire, the players begin the process of documenting the creative output of a jazz master. The music that we play tonight is altogether different from the Forerunner, the first Forerunner music. He gave me a, 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 a demo of about two dozen original compositions. And these were all things that he had done in his home studio. I started sitting down and transcribing them and, and with the idea of maybe recording this music. Well, I was talking to Mike and, uh, over a period of time, and uh, I guess at the same time I was talking to Mike about this idea of recording like that with an ensemble. He was talking to his father, Jimmy Merritt, about recording compositions that have never been recorded before. the musicians are prepared. With Jimmy's encouragement, the logistics needed to start recording have all been worked out. Calling on favors, asking friends for help, but it is still a work in progress. This is one of the greatest things that you ever could, have, to, could do for your father, is to fly in from California, get the musicians together, communicate with the musicians, and all of the musicians respect you just like they respect Jimmy. What you're doing right now, documenting, uh, is the beginning of uh, a history that could be based on. Everything that, that I'm playing came from Jimmy, literally. The Forerunners, you know, it's, it's definitely an opening, you know, like a rebirth. Yeah, I think it should be good worldwide as much as possible. Everybody should get exposed to this. Oh man, this is heaven, man. Don't get no better than this, man. No, I man, I'm having the fun of my life, man. It's extraordinary. We're going to get every single nuance. The goal is to establish the Forerunners as a working unit and expand their base to a wider audience, educate fellow musicians, jazz scholars, and students. And they will continue to go as far as their sacrifice and dedication will take them. <laughs>